Hey folks, welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. It's your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and today we are listening to a pre-recorded um, episode of The Flower Farmer Show. Today I'm chatting about why cool flower planting timing is so important. So let's take a listen. Hey friends, welcome to the Flower Farmer Show. And today we've got something kind of new in store. I um, I have one of our team members, Jesse's going to be joining us. And um, Clubhouse has a new feature where folks can actually text in questions. So we're going to give just a minute here to let Jesse get here and um, let folks get loaded up. And we are, I am attempting to record this week. Um, so just so people are aware of that. And so welcome, Jesse. We're so glad to have you here. So Jesse is the newest member of the Gardener's Workshop team. And she helps me with all this social media stuff. And um, she is here today to co-host to help me um, with taking these questions. So I'm going to give us a talk uh, about cool flowers. I got some really specific things I want to talk about. And um, you, so that way you don't have to raise your hand and come up to come up to ask your question. You can text it. But I'm going to ask Jesse to unmute herself and kind of introduce herself and then tell folks how they'll be able to do that. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessie Graven, and I'm a new member of the Gardener's Workshop team, as Lisa mentioned. And uh, one of the things that I want to do today is help Lisa uh, answer your questions related to Cool Flowers and what she's going to be discussing today. Um, you're still welcome uh, to um, ask to come up and ask your question in person uh Verbally, uh, but if you do not want to do that, you're also welcome to send me um, a chat message question via the new back channel feature, which is um, should be in the bottom right hand corner of your phone, and it looks like a little paper airplane. Uh, so if you hit that button and uh, send me a message. Uh, then uh, I will be able to um, get that to Lisa so that she can answer it in, at the end of the show. So thanks, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Jesse. And I was wondering what that little new icon at the bottom of the screen is, because we realize not everybody is comfortable speaking publicly. So we are really glad that Clubhouse added this feature because we know people have questions. And I will say again that we are recording this today, um, and so we're trying to help those folks that couldn't make it to be able to listen to this. So um, I want to. So today I want to talk about, which is seems to be the topic of the month, and I'm I'm sure it'll be the topic of discussion probably for the next two or three months. Actually, is about cool flowers. And for those of you that may not be familiar, cool flowers is the name of my book that's about growing cool season hardy annual flowers. Um, they're like some of the most spectacular spring blooming flowers. Um, for my farm, they were over a third of our cash crop um, growing, you know, 100% in the field with no houses. And so there's just, I know that it's a really um, new subject for folks to wrap their heads around that haven't been growing cool flowers now for several years. And so I didn't think this idea up, y'all. Our grandmas used to practice this. Um, but growing and planting these cool season hardy annuals at their awkward planting time kind of fell away from gardeners from the last few decades. And we're just kind of rekindling that and bringing it back. And so there are so many aspects to cool flowers that people are so confused by. And I want to share that I have over on our website, which is thegardenersworkshop.com, if you go to the Learning Center and go to my Field and Garden blog and podcast 
and then just tap the little cool flower category, the first thing to come up is a series called the Cool Season Flower Chronicles. And that is a clearing house of many cool flower resources. There's a free webinar there. There's the Cool Season series that you can watch. There's a planting guide. There's a link directly to buy a book if you need it. There's a link to Cool Flower Seeds. So it's kind of become, I'm trying to put everything there that is related to help you with cool flowers. Because here's the thing, y'all. Even I sit down and refresh um, because we forget stuff about this different group of plants that are to be planted. And particularly if you're not, haven't been doing it um, for a couple of decades, it is really hard to remember everything. So I recommend refreshing, reading through the book, watch the book study if you want to, watch the Cool Flower Refresher webinar, and surely the cool the chronicle series are all of the misconceptions and misunderstandings that we get asked about all the time so i just wanted to put that out there that that those resources are there and available to anybody um that needs them and frankly we all need them um we need to get refreshed so today i am talking about um why Sticking with your planting time is really essential to success. And what I mean by that, I'm not talking today about how you figure out whether you fall or very early spring plant, because that's a whole discussion in itself. And you can really learn that from those resources that I just shared with you. But a problem that a lot of people face, particularly those of us that are over eager to get started, um, we tend to find out that, okay, this is what I can plant in the fall, and I know that my fall planting window is six to eight weeks before my first historic first frost, okay? And I'm just going to use my dates as examples here. My first frost is mid-November, so my target planting date is typically mid-September to October 1st. Well, particularly at this time of the year when some of us are just so hot and overheated and we just are kind of maybe spending a little bit more time indoors, we're thinking, I'm going to get a jump start on cool flowers. And they end up planting too early. They know when their planting window is, and they do one of two things. They either start their transplants way too early, and y'all, there is nothing more heartbreaking then starting your transplants too early, and they're gorgeous. You know, they're two weeks old, then they're three weeks old, and then they're four weeks old, and they're looking so awesome, but it's still 92 degrees outside. You know it's too hot to plant these cool season hardy annuals. Keep saying that to yourself, cool season, y'all. They prefer cooler temperatures. Um, and so you're, you got your transplants, and it's still too hot, and so you're doing everything you can indoors or even outdoors under cover or in a protected area to keep them in the coolest spot possible. But it does not take long for those transplants to grow into ugly, leggy, diseased transplants. And there is nothing you can do to fix that except trash them and start over again. So I am just... This is your public notice that starting your transplants too early is a really slow torture for you and the plants. <clears throat> so let's just say you do do it, and then you decide you are going to plant them outside because what do you have to lose besides, you know, a lot of things, morale, energy, um, you know, just getting worn out and tired over it. When you plant cool flower transplants outside too early, a couple of things can happen. Um, for me, because we really love planting our transplants in the fall into that Bio360 biodegradable film with the black side up, because those plants benefit all winter from that black film heating the soil and helping them along. Um, 
if we tried to plant, and unfortunately, I will confess that I have done it. I'm speaking from firsthand experience, especially when we were planting, you know, 50,000 transplants in the fall for spring. You just want to get started, right? You know, you want to get ready, get on the job and get some of it out of the way and checked off your list. So I have cooked more transplants than most people have probably. And there's really nothing you can do when you plant too early into high temperatures as we classically have here in Virginia, um, early in the fall. Um, there's just no, you can stand there with a hose and water, but the heat from that black film just literally cooks those seedlings. Um, and so that is a really big problem, obviously, because it literally kills your seedlings, right? But let's just say you squeak them in and somehow manage to have them um, not die. If you plant them too early, what is then going to happen is that those transplants are going to grow way too big before winter really gets here. And, you know, a 12 to 15 to 20 inch plant is not going to face winter and survive typically. Um, the whole concept of cool flowers is that you plant a transplant or a seed out in the garden in fall, like weather, for the transplant to either become established or for that seed to sprout into a baby plant and that when winter sets in six to eight weeks later, you've got this great little you know, four to six inch transplant that's well established and it's ready to face whatever winter brings for your zone because you're only planting those plants that are winter hardy in your zone, right? So if you plant them too early, they are going to grow just too darn big. And that has happened to us um, by no fault of our own. Several years ago, um, we planted as we normally do and we had our first frost in November, but then it became summer again, it seemed like. I mean, we got really warm days with some cool nights. And um, what happened was our cool flowers started to grow. And at Christmas, we still had not put our row covers up. Um, we use row covers, as I'll talk about later, um, for wind protection and from deer and varmints, um, not for cold. Well, it was still so hot, we could not put our row covers up. So I always now, always err on planting later than earlier. And then direct seeding too early. You just don't even know how many people call our warehouse every day when this season rolls around because they have planted their cool flower seeds too early. Many of these seeds that prefer to be direct seeded need cool nights, and warm days, y'all. So if it's not below 60 or 65 at night, it's just not time yet. And when you plant your seeds out in the garden, guess what does germinate and grow like crazy? Are all of the native weeds. And your seeds are just going to sit there until the temperatures are right. But by that time, they're usually totally consumed by weed pressure, unless you're really being um, on top of taking care of the weeds. And I'll tell you that my um, method of direct seeding and having such clean beds and great stands of plants is that even in my 30 inch row, my 30 inch wide beds, I only put three rows when I direct seed, which gives me about eight to 10 inches between the three rows of seeds that I plant. And that allows me to ho, 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 y'all. Um, if you don't know about our garden hoe, you've got to go to our website, go to the store, go to the hoe, and look at the video. Um, this is the secret to great direct seeding and getting a good stand of plants, the way you plant them and then how you prevent weeds from happening. So those are all the problems that you have with too early. Too late is a little bit more flexible. Um, so too late would mean that you're planting your, you're trying to direct seed and your frost date's already passed and it's cold outside. Well, even if it's a cool season hardy annual, it still needs some heat to germinate or some warmth. So I will say that you have more flexibility with transplants than you do with direct seeding with being late. So let's talk about transplants first. So the reason you have more flexibility is because the transplants 
can tolerate the cold weather and you can provide some protection to allow those roots to get well rooted in. They don't have to germinate. They already germinated inside in controlled conditions, right? So you can, so here's what I would say to you. If you find yourself, whether you have a failure of some kind with a cool flower crop that's a transplant, um, and you say, oh my gosh, I lost all of my, you know, for us, it would be like losing all of our snaps. Snaps are a huge and sweet William. Both those are huge cash crops for us. And so if something were to have happened to them, I would immediately prepare, start the seed indoors and then prepare the bed so that when those plants are finally ready to transplant out, which will be weeks later, the bed is ready and waiting for them. If you wait to prepare the bed to when those transplants will be late coming in, um, you run the risk of the ground being too wet or having snow on it um, or any number of problems, right? So there's definitely more flexibility with transplants. I have been known here in southeastern Virginia to transplant every month of the year um, because I've started them for whatever reason and when they didn't get planted as long as you have the beds prepared we always prepare our fall prepared beds we also plant our very early spring planting beds at the same time they go through winter empty um, and that allows us to have this wiggle room to transplant later into the season um, direct seeding you don't have quite as much flexibility you can surely try it and even if you hoop and cover a direct seeded bed you still may not have as much success. Um, so I would try not to do that, um, but you can do it if you hoop and cover. And that's one of the things that I want to finish off my talk about. And then we're going to have time for you guys. Please ask your questions. So now we know that we can text them that little paper airplane looking emblem on the bottom of your screen to the right you can text to jesse your questions and then she'll ask them for you or you can hit the little hand at the bottom and i want to hear your questions y'all um totally understand how hard this is to wrap your head around so the last what i want to finish up with is that i feel like and I just kind of realized this when I was doing Ask a Flower Farmer on Instagram Live earlier today. I totally attribute my great success with cool flowers and the quality of my flowers and plants and how early I get them to bloom in the spring because of the fact that I use so much lightweight row cover, hoops, and weight bags. So... I typically do not plant any cool flower <clears throat> in the fall that's not winter hardy in my zone. And so that means that basically I don't plant straw flowers in the fall. I don't plant stock in the fall. Um, and those get planted in very early spring because we know that those don't just do very well here in my zone. So everybody else is winter hardy. That means they don't need cold protection. However, think about my plants planted on that black film or even direct seeded at the right time so there's a little three or four inch plant in there and then they get hooped with the wire hoops and the lightweight Ag-19 row cover. And then on top of that, um, you know, I learned, I live in a really, really windy site. I learned years ago that if you're going to use row covers and you really want to depend on them, you need to have adequate weights to hold your row covers down. And y'all, do not use clips. Do not use boards. All of that stuff will ultimately rip your row cover, especially when the wind comes. Um, laying weight bags, which are just sandbags full of either gravel, sand, or dirt, whatever you have, um, at about 15 pounds a piece, we watch our lightweight row covers protect our beds through 25 to 30 mile an hour nonstop winds, even literally for days. Think about what my plants would look like if they didn't have, think of it as a um, windbreaker jacket. It just protects them. In addition to that, it concentrates the 
um, sunshine. So think about a bright sunny day. It's 20 degrees outside, 10 degrees outside, or whatever it is where you are. With that hoop and row cover down, with the wind sealed out, and that black film underneath there, I mean, it heats up under there during the day. I mean, it's like a dream come true for plants um, as well as pests. You know, so you, that's why we have to keep an eye on what's going on under our row covers, because that's like a dream place to live. Um, and because I was a big row cover user from the get go, I feel like that's a really important part of why I have so much success with cool flowers. Um, and so I'm going to I want to say that um, you can watch videos of how I put down row covers, how I use them. If you go to the gardener's workshop, go to the store and go to those products, there's a video on each one of them showing you how to install them and use them. So, Jesse, do we have any questions? I haven't received any um, questions yet via the back channel, and it doesn't look like anyone has raised their hand to come up yet. Um, I did think of one uh, question that you may want to um, go over. Uh, seems like um, I haven't heard whether or not cool flowers typically need to be watered over the winter, like once they're established, or if they need to be fertilized over the winter, that kind of thing. That is a great question, Jesse. Thank you. So, um, it really, of course, you have to kind of look at your situation. Here where I am, we do tend to get a fair amount of rain during the winter, snow and ice. And <clears throat> so our practice has been, um, we do install irrigation underneath the biodegradable film. Our tractor actually puts that down. And when we made them by hand for many years, we also laid, it's called tea tape. And that is a type of irrigation. It looks like a ribbon. And um, that is underneath of our film. And so when our beds are made for fall and very early spring planting, um, the tea tape is under the film and ready to be hooked up and used. However, we do not hook it up to use it um, until next spring when needed. Because we don't want to run water through the tape, because um, a couple of things can happen um, when you do that. Um, first off, your fittings can freeze and crack, which is a problem, um, because there's water left in the tape. And then if you have, you know, below freezing weather, which we do, we go down into the, the teens here occasionally, but we're definitely below freezing here. Um, and so that is a problem. But also, Rodents like rabbits and squirrels and rats and mice are also seeking moisture um, during the winter. And so by filling those tapes up with water, um, that tends to encourage them to chew those. And I'll tell you a great tip. Um, you can, when you install tea tape with either, you don't have to have a tractor. I will tell you that my friends at Hosses, that's H-O-S-S -S, Tools, He's down in Georgia. He has an amazing wheel hoe, and one of the attachments that they sell with the wheel hoe installs T-tape. And what is so significant about that than, than you just rolling it out and laying it on the ground is it puts it a couple inches below soil level. And my tractor does this, too. And what that does is when, you're, when your irrigation tape is below soil level, you basically have zero damage from creatures. Um, so that gives you a little bit more flexibility. And so so we don't water during winter. We water um, when we plant our transplants. They're very well watered. We water our direct seeded beds by hand with a hose wand. Um, it's quick and easy and fairly fast to do. And, you know, the other thing, and Dave even talks about this, is that even if you did have irrigation, we would still hand water. That is such a key time to be certain that your plants 
or get each plant is getting water. So like on our biofilm um, with the transplant, there's a plant in each hole. You know, we know that each plant is getting its dose of water. Um, and sometimes with irrigation, the tape could be moved away from where the transplants are and you can't really see that. So we feel like at this key point, um, we definitely want to provide water. Then during winter, what you have to remember is that it's not hot outside typically. So that means water, um, watering lasts a lot longer, meaning the ground does not dry out, which is a real reason that we learn a lot about our gardens that we might not have known growing just summer crops. Um, because during the winter, you might think you have a great drainage area, but in the winter, you find that, oh my gosh, now that's not like 90 degrees outside, which helps evaporate a lot of the water from the soil, you find that there's puddles where you've planted your cool flowers, which can definitely be a problem. So when you do water at the beginning of the season, um, you will have to really gauge when and if you ever need to water again during the winter. But if you get significant rain and or snow or ice, that is all watering. And you'll find it just lasts longer. So we typically do not water by hand or otherwise during the winter months. Um, for your fertilization part of your question, um, we do um, apply a general purpose organic fertilizer when we prepare our beds. It's a dry fertilizer. And we incorporate that when we prepare the beds. And then nothing else would be fed with anything until spring growth starts again. Um, so that makes it really pretty simple. And um, then when spring comes, once they start to grow, we can do um, either a foliar Soak, which is just called a foliar feeding, which just means y'all putting the liquid fertilizer in a hose sprayer and spraying your plants and even doing a soil drench. Um, or you can run it through your irrigation with an, a fertigator. Um, so, and I see we have a couple of questions now, Jesse. Can you bring them up or should I bring them up? I think you may want to bring them up. Okay. So I've asked Mark up for a question. Hi, Mark. Hey, friend. How you doing? I am good. It's so good to hear your voice. We only talk on social media, so good to hear you. What you got? I got a question. It's just a little bit off topic. I hope that's okay. It is. Okay. I've noticed since um, it's gotten so hot, uh, when I go out and harvest my sunflowers, at the Right under the uh, leaves, right around the blooms, it looks to be little egg sacs. M looks much like uh, a tadpole egg sac, like foam. Oh. I, what is that? Is it something I need to be concerned about? Does it Does it look like somebody just spit on your sunflower? <laughs> it looks like one of my grandsons blew their nose on it. Exactly. That's a <laughs> that is a spittle bug. And that is, I hope I'm saying that right, um, and that is the egg sac. So look that up, um, spittle bug. And um, okay. we just started finding them, too. It used to, let me tell you something, not much grosses my sister out, but those bugs would push her over the edge. Um, so let us know what you find out, but that's exactly what it is. So thanks for asking. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to ask Ann up. Hi, Ann. How are you? Oh, so cool to talk to you. Um, so my question is about germination, uh, germinating the cool season flowers. Do you use your germination chamber or do you use heat mats? Um, I know... A lot of times, like, their best temperature is 65 or such. So I didn't know how you deal with the hot, like, in your grow room. Um, does, some, does that affect how your seeds germinate? Those are such great questions, and yes. So I'm glad you asked that because that is really a problem that people face. 
So what she's speaking of is how to get cool season hardy annuals to germinate when it is just so darn hot. And so I'm really fortunate that my grow room um, is a part of a building that is actually air conditioned. And so we are able to leave the door open to that room because my target temperature to get the best germination um, of those cool flowers is like 65 to 70 degrees air temperature. And to answer your question of we do, I do not use my germination chamber on cool flowers typically because it has to be heated up. Um, to such a degree for that steam, I have just found much better success with using my seedling heat mats. Y'all ready for this? With a, with cookie cooling racks. You know, the little racks you put cookies on when you bring them out of the oven. We put those racks directly on the heat mat and that creates a little airspace between the bottom of your trays and the heat mat. And so that takes a little bit of the heat off of the heat mat, but it still provides consistent warmth, which is what cool flower needs. And then with an air temperature of 65 to 70 degrees, we get excellent germination in that room. So I would say that most people's homes for germinating with a seedling heat mat are probably a pretty good, well, we keep our house pretty cool, like at 68 degrees. So you're looking for 65 to 70 degree air temperature with a heat mat um, that is typically 15 to 20 degrees warmer than that. And then the cookie cooling racks in between to help cool it down. Um, but that works like a charm for us for snaps and rebecchias and just all of them. Does that help? Oh my gosh, that helps so much. Thank you, Lisa. If you see my question, I like tried to type my question too. So if you see it, I might have asked twice. That's all right. I, Thanks for asking. Thanks for coming up. We we love hearing people's voices. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. So, um, that kind of wraps it up for the show, but I want people, y'all, I want to answer your questions. I love connecting and, and helping to answer those things that sometimes just aren't clicking yet. Um, so next week, same place, same time, right here at the Flower Farmer Show on Clubhouse. Um, bring your questions, and Jesse and I will be here. You can text them to her or we'll bring you up. Oh, we have another question, so we'll take one more. It's Anne. Another Anne. Yes, this is Anne of Atlanta. How are you, Lisa? I am very good, Anne. Thank you so much for coming up. What's your, what's your question? Uh, Lizzie Anthes. I had a hard time uh, with them in uh, landscape fabric last year. I'm zone 8A. A hen bit got down all in the holes right around the plant, Try to pull the hen bit up. The Lizzie's plant would come up. I actually saw something about planting, um, uh, you know, get I'm going to get them as plugs and then move them up into, like, I think they said 48-cell packs uh, and kind of overwinter them. I was just curious if you've done that or I've heard of anybody doing that instead of planting them in the ground so early, just from a, uh, a preventing weed issue. Right. Well, there's just no question that Lizzie Anthus is a bit of a – a weed problem at times and it's because they don't produce a covering canopy that covers the surrounding area like other plants do that just kind of shade that stuff out and we do a lot of whole wheat weeding on our farm um, that's what we call when we weed those holes and I don't use landscape fabric but we use the bio 360 film and we plant actually the 285 size which is not much bigger than the tip of your pinky, um, out in the field. Um, and then we just make it a, I mean, it is a weekly task um, to go out there. And what we typically do is just put our fingers on the plant while we pull what's right next to it. Um, and so I know people that bump them up, like you're talking about moving them up to a larger size. Um I haven't done that. It's very labor intensive. Um, and the problem that I would anticipate would be smaller plants 
get better established quicker than larger plants do typically. Um, so I would say if you're going to get those plug tray, you order what size plugs did you order, Ann? Uh, I did the 128. So that's pretty big. I mean, I, I mean, I don't. Are you going to use landscape cloth again? Uh, no, definitely not. <coughs> um, you know, the other factor that I have is I am 66 and bending over and doing. I'd, I'd rather have them higher up to work with. Yeah. Know, so that was my main consideration. Yeah. So I mean, give it a try, and you know, it's. It's labor intensive regardless of what you're going to do. Um, so the big step that I would think of is how to prevent the weed seeds on the surface of that bed, such as silage tarping that bed for weeks in the hot sun um, to cook whatever is there and then not to disturb it. Leave it that way until you plant your lizzie. So there's not, does that make sense? So there's not a lot of weed seeds on the surface that are viable. Um, so I think that's what I would do. Um, so you could do that now. Prepare your bed. Get it ready like you're getting ready to plant. But then you cover it with, um, you can't use landscape fabric for that because landscape fabric allows water to get through. You want um, a heavy-duty plastic, which is what a silage tarp is, um, and black side up so that it cooks everything underneath there. And then that will create a bed with less viable seeds, and hopefully that will help get you over the hump. That sounds great. I do have one of those silage tarps, so I, I've got that. Thanks, Lisa. You're so welcome. So we have one more, and I'm going to take it. Thank you guys for, for asking. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Hi. Thanks so much for coming up. What, what's your question? Hi. I, I tried to text it, but I'm not sure if it went through. But um, I am in the Pacific Northwest uh, in Canada, just outside of Vancouver, um, and we tend to average temperatures – you know, in the 50 to 60 degrees through to, like, December. But then we get a really cold snap, usually in January, February, down to, like, 5. And I'm just wondering, like, listening to your comment about plants getting big and then not surviving winter, um, would my – if I did – I haven't done cool flowers before, so this is my first year I'm going to try. Awesome. Um, is that a – like, is that a problem? Like, if they'll get too big growing, you know, through November, December, because we often are so warm – um, to make it through that kind of cold snap, or would row covers and protection kind of be enough just for that week or two where it gets really cold? Sure. So what zone are you? Um, technically 7A or 7B, and that's based on that, like, one really cold snap. But the rest of the year we are actually quite mild. So it's and a little bit, you know, <laughs> mis mis uh, leading. Right. And then so when would you say your first frost is? In the fall or winter or yeah, we normally get frost already starting in November. Okay. So it's kind of like that one year that you mentioned where, like, yeah, we get frost, but then at Christmas it could be, you know, 60 degrees. Right, um, and that's so okay. 60 is not bad. It's when um, what we experience here is we get afternoons that climb up into the 80s and 90s, uh, and that's okay. what really drives it. So you really live in a perfect dream <laughs> Cool flower land. Um, okay. So I would say for you to, to, to take that first historical frost date, um, and you might want to, I mean, and if you're not so warm, follow the six to eight week rule, but I think you'll be in really good shape. And if your plants do get bigger um, and then you get some super cold, um, certainly row cover would help protect them. But I think that they won't grow so big at those cooler, 50 to 60 sounds like a dream. That sounds pretty awesome. good. So That's good clear. luck to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You are so welcome. So I see we have one more, and this is going to be the last one. And thank you guys so much for being willing to come up here and ask. <coughs> Hello? Hi, Tanya. It's Lisa. Have you got a question for us? Yeah. Um, so last year, I um, was my first cool flower try, and I had success with my sweet lamb and fever pew and faster buttons. I'm zone six, but I feel like everything I plant 
uh, blooms about two weeks later than other people I see in zone six. Um, but in their very, very early spring, how early, I know it's six to eight weeks, but what am I looking for as far as like soil wetness, wetness or frost still kind of in the soil um, before I can truly plant out those cool flowers, the transplants? What good question that is. So first off, um, you know, even though you're going to be, so is that when you planted those cool flowers last year was in very early spring, you didn't do fall? No, I did the fall. Okay. So the, the sweet linium and the fever view and the basher buttons. Okay, um, sure. Very well. I was, I was very happy. Um, but then like agrostema and, um, I forget what else I had. Okay. Um, so I do think that you could add to your fall lineup several selections. I mean, like, you know, Snaps and Sweet William, all of those do super in the fall and would be really strong for you. But your very, everything can be planted in very early spring. Um, and the key is to prepare those beds in the fall and keep them covered somehow to prevent weed growth. Um, and Cool, those cool flowers, let's just say that aren't hardy enough to go through your long cold winter, they can still take frost. So you can still plant them six to eight weeks before your last frost date. It's that they can't take long term cold after cold after cold. Um, for instance, like we plant stock only in very early spring because it just doesn't do our winter, but we literally almost every year plant it into snow. Snow covered beds. So we've got snow and freezing weather and they love it. <laughs> I mean, it's like it crisps them up. It just makes them so happy. So I would follow the six to eight week rule, have the beds ready and just go out there and plant your stuff. And I think you'll be surprised. Okay. Just, just go for it. Yes. It's hard. <laughs> we know, but just go for it. The plants are not afraid. It's only us that's afraid. So, okay, thank you. Thanks for coming up. All right, everybody, we're going to wrap it up and thank you so much. And we, Jesse and I, will see you next week right here. And remember that we have a new closed Facebook group called The Flower Farmer Show. And that's where I'm taking my suggestions from about what we should talk about on this show. So if you're a Facebooker, come on over and request to get in. And we'd love to have you join with us. So till we meet again, friends. Ciao. All right, friends. I hope that you enjoyed that. And hey, I'm inviting you all to join our closed Facebook group called The Flower Farmer Show, to join me over on Clubhouse for The Flower Farmer Show live on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You'll also be able to connect with me on Instagram Live, Ask a Flower Farmer, which is at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesdays each week where I do my best to answer your questions related to cut flower growing, the business, the farming, farm dogs, and anything else related. As well as friends, you'll find me live from the farm on Fridays at 6 p.m. Eastern on Facebook Live where we start our weekly sunflowers or whatever is going on here on the farm. So remember, you can make all my connections over on thegardenersworkshop.com where you'll find our online courses. You'll find all of my favorite gardening tools, seeds, and supplies in my books. And friends, a ton more of resources. So fall on over to thegardenersworkshop.com. Ciao.